Good morning to you, everyone, and welcome to the IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. Today, uh, I am thrilled to roll out the latest week's episode with Professor Andrew Childs, who will join us in just a minute. Before we get there, I'm also glad you've joined us on time because we have a small tradition here to give everyone just about a minute or two to tune into the live stream. And meanwhile, to get familiar and uh, say, answer my favorite question, which is where are you tuning in from today? You can reply to that in the comment chat box, which is located up below left to right, somewhere on your screen. Let us know where you're tuning in from. That's the same place in the same place where you can ask questions live of Andrew Childs and myself during the talk. You can discuss and comment and we should keep it pretty lively. We also have a special announcement, which is that the Kiskit Global Summer School, the fourth year of the Kiskit Global Summer School will be back and it's open. The registration is open. So if you go to the Kiskit Twitter, you will find out uh, where that is and hopefully it's still open. Uh, and I'll be happy to be lecturing there for the fourth year in a row. So let us know if you've signed up yet or uh, what you'd like to learn about. So folks, with that, I think you know that this seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time right here on the Kiskid YouTube channel and you can stay updated. Don't forget, we appreciate the click, like, and subscribe. And with that, let's get started. I'm your host from IBM Quantum Research and this is episode 123 where I have the absolute personal delight and privilege to introduce you to Professor Andrew Childs. And hello, Andrew. How are hello. you today? I'm great. Great. How are you doing? Great. It's uh, we love that you accept the invitation. Where are you tuning in from? I, I'm at uh, the University of Maryland in College Park. All right. Well, that's a perfect segue to uh, my introduction for you. Uh, and then we'll pull your slides right up. Andrew Childs is the co-director of QUICS, the Joint Center of Quantum Information and Computer Science, a partnership between the University of Maryland and NIST. Andrew is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and the Institute uh, for Advanced Computer Studies and also the director of the NSF Quantum Leap Challenge Institute for RQS, Robust Quantum Simulation. Uh, if, if we go back in time to 2004, you would have found Andrew at MIT uh, for his doctoral studies, uh, following which Andrew went uh, on to be a Dew Bridge postdoctoral scholar at Caltech until 2007. Andrew then became faculty member of Combinatorics and Optimization at the Institute for Quantum Computing, IQC, at the University of Waterloo, where he was until 2014, and then joined Maryland. With that, Andrew, it's an absolute delight to have you here, and the stage is yours. Thank you, uh, Zlatko. Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, um, you know, talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, I'd like to tell you about um, uh, you know, some work we did on uh, a strategy for developing quantum algorithms that we call Quantum Divide and Conquer. Um, this is joint work with some, you know, really fantastic collaborators. Um, Robin Kothari, who was at Microsoft when this work was done, although he's since moved to Google. Uh, Matt Kowalczyk, um, Arthi Sundaram, uh, and Dao Chen Wang. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, work that you can find described in more detail in a preprint on the archive. Uh, if you're if you're interested in learning more, uh, you can go there and you can, you know, read all about it. Okay, so um, I'd like to to tell you about this. Um, you know, framework for developing, uh, you know, quantum algorithms. But to put it, it in context, let me start by talking a little bit about the kind of basic question that, um, you know, uh, is really the thing that uh, I guess is at the kind of core of my research and that I think a lot of us are interested in in the field, which is understanding the power of quantum computers. Uh, so, you know, we know through, uh, you know, algorithms that have been developed that there are some problems that we can solve uh, faster. Apparently, we can solve faster with quantum computers than we could using classical computers by somehow, you know, carefully designing the interference um, between a lot of different computational paths that a quantum computer can explore. Uh, and, you know, figuring out exactly how to do that and what is the extent of the advantage that we can get by using this ability to compute in superposition is, um, you know, there's a lot that we know about that, but definitely a lot that we don't know about that. And we would like to basically explore, uh, you know, this, this question to better understand what is the computational advantage we can get out of quantum mechanics. Um, so, you know, just to kind of give a little bit of the, the lay of the land of what, what kinds of um, advantage we can expect, you know, there are some problems for which we, uh, you know, can get, depending on the, the model, maybe we can prove we can get, or maybe uh, we just have uh, good reason to believe that we can get 
um, you know, a, a very significant quantum speed up, an exponential speed up, or maybe at least a super polynomial speed up over uh, what it's possible to do with classical algorithms. Uh, and this includes, for example, you know, the factoring algorithm, uh, the, the challenge of simulating quantum mechanics, uh, but also a bunch of other things that have been discovered over the years that, you know, show us how to do something, uh, you know, better than polynomially faster using a quantum computer than we would be able to using a classical computer. And then there's a whole other, um, you know, set of problems and, and uh, you know, a bigger set of problems, I would say, for which we can get uh, maybe not exponential speed up, but polynomial speed up. Uh, you know, a, a common thing would be maybe we can get a quadratic speed up or, uh, you know, in some cases, maybe um, in less, uh, maybe a little bit less or maybe a little bit more than a quadratic speed up, um, you know, but a polynomial speed up over what we can do uh, classically. And, uh, you know, for, for this kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, less significant speed up, there's a broader class of problems for which we, we know how to do this. So um, here are the kind of like, uh, you know, best known example is, is probably the unstructured search problem where Grover showed how to get a quadratic speed up. But there's a whole bunch of other problems having to do with, you know, evaluating formulas or, uh, you know, problems in graphs or various kinds of algebraic problems or string problems uh, for which we can give uh, polynomial speedups. And uh, the you kind of uh, core question in the, in the area that I would really like to understand better and that I think a lot of us would like to understand better is, you know, what are the problems for which we can have a significantly faster quantum algorithm than a, than a classical one? How much speed up can we, can we hope to get? And, um, you know, what does sort of the landscape look like of possible quantum speed ups? So, you know, what we're going to see in this talk is that, uh, you know, we've developed a tool which, um, you know, we'll, we'll see some examples where we can get uh, polynomial quantum speed ups. Although, as I'll mention later on, you know, the idea of exponential quantum speed up with these techniques that I'm talking about, uh, you know, is not completely off the table. And that's maybe an interesting direction to think about. So anyway, we'll, we'll get to there uh, later on. Okay. Maybe, and, you know, oh, sorry. Maybe not to throw in a question too early in the talk, but if, yeah, you, if you will have one. Um, um, that, that might come up a lot in these, especially I think we had listed quantum uh, linear algebra. Could, could you say some, could you make a comment about some of the asterisks that go with some of these exponential speed ups uh, or, or, you know, what the conditions, uh, you know, and thinking about quantum RAM or things like that, that, right. that make things a bit more subtle perhaps. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think for, for, you know, many of these problems, you know, there, there is, um, uh, you know, there are sometimes, uh, you know, subtleties having to do with the way the problem is presented, what exactly are the assumptions about the kind of access that's available to the problem, and the kind of, uh, you know, output that's produced. And that's definitely a, a um, you know, an issue, for example, I, you know, I mentioned here, quantum linear algebra without saying what that means, right? So there are these algorithms for, um, you know, producing a kind of a quantum encoding of the solution of a, you know, high dimensional system of linear equations, um, you know, in a time that would be much less than the time that it would take to classically solve the system of equations, you know, but this is a nat sort of apples and oranges comparison. The quantum algorithm is doing something very different. It's producing, you know, a, a kind of quantum encoding that's definitely not the same thing as having a, um, you know, an explicit, um, you know, an explicit, uh, you know, complete classical description of the, of the solution. So, you know, that's definitely the case with many of those algorithms that there are, you know, there are sort of subroutines that allow you to do something that, is maybe uh, surprisingly fast that you can do quantum mechanically, but you do have to be careful about comparing that to what it is that you can do classically. So, I mean, I would say that for the, you know, in, specifically in the context of this talk, um, this issue is not going to come up so much um, other than just to say that we're gonna focus on a black box model of computation where the input is gonna be generally speaking a string and we're gonna have a black box that gives us access to the characters of that string and really the only question we're going to ask is how many of those accesses do we need to make? How many um, characters of the string do we need to query to determine some property of the string? So, so you know, that's the setting for this talk. That's the mathematical model. And, uh, you know, in, in that context, it'll be a very clear comparison between, you know, classical costs and quantum costs, you know, in the context of query complexity. Thank you for the clear explanation, Andrew. Sure. Um, okay, great. So um, the kind of next thing that I wanted to say is just that, um, you know, one of the obstacles to finding quantum algorithms and understanding what kinds of speed up we can, we can, uh, you know, hope to have with, with quantum computers, um, you know, is kind of a lack of tools for developing quantum algorithms. So obviously, you know, classical algorithms have been studied for a long time. There are lots of, you know, ideas that have been developed over many years um, that, you know, are things that we know are sometimes useful in, in um, you know, developing 
you know, classical algorithms. And you know, quantum computing hasn't been around as long, so we don't have as many tools. There are certainly a bunch of tools that have been um, you know, explored and found to be useful. You know, for example, the idea of Fourier sampling, or like this, this idea, this primitive called phase estimation, uh, you know, which is related to that, is you know something that's really useful in a lot of quantum algorithms. You know, the idea of Grover search or amplitude amplification is something that's useful in a lot of these algorithms with polynomial speed up. You know, quantum analogs of random walks are another thing that's turned out to be useful in a bunch of different contexts. So, you know, it's not like our toolbox is empty. We definitely have some things that we know how to how to use in a quantum computing context to develop algorithms. But um, uh, the toolbox is not that full. And the more tools that we can develop, uh, you know, the more ideas we have when we're approaching some new problem or we're trying to understand what kinds of quantum speedups we can we can hope for. Um, you know, the better position we're in, the more the more tools we have. And so that's really the, the goal of this talk is to develop, you know, not just like to find some specific quantum speedups for a few specific problems, although that's part of it, um, but really to sort of talk about a tool that is something that you can imagine applying if you want to develop some new quantum algorithm. Uh, and we would like to understand, you know, how, just how useful this tool is, how broadly applicable it is, how, you know, to what extent we can generalize it beyond the specific things I'm going to tell you about today. Um, but, you know, that's 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 really the goal. The, the primary goal, I guess, of this talk is to talk about a... Um, you know, a new tool. And, you know, just in terms of the, like, the, the bigger picture, um, you know, finding more and more tools, you know, for this, for this toolbox uh, is, I think, really a, a key challenge for the field. And it would be great to have, you know, other ways we could think about, um, you know, designing, um, uh, you know, uh, quantum interference to do something that's computationally useful, right? It's a, it's like a pretty non-intuitive non thing to think about how you would somehow, you know, take advantage of, uh, this very specific kind of thing that quantum computers can do. And so the more ways we have of sort of like, you know, organizing that when we think about, uh, you know, coming up with algorithms, you know, the better. Okay, so the kind of specific tool we're going to talk about is this thing called divide and conquer. And it's it's really like a quantum analog of something that's a, um, uh, you know, kind of well-known classical idea in, in the context of classical algorithms. So, you know, this last semester I taught an undergraduate course on algorithms. And one of the things that we did was to talk about divide and conquer algorithms and how you could apply this strategy in developing, uh, you know, fast classical algorithms, you know, which in the context of the class, we just call algorithms, uh, you know, for, for problems, right? So, um, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this kind of really core idea for, for classical algorithms, and we're going to try to come up with a quantum analog that is going to give us some, some new quantum speedups. And the strategy is very, you know, kind of basic and, and uh, you know, kind of natural, I think. So you've got some problem you want to solve. You're going to divide it into subproblems. Then you're going to solve those subproblems um, recursively. So the algorithm you use to solve these problems, these subproblems, is the algorithm that I'm describing now, you know, kind of until you get to some small base case that you can just, you know, solve by brute force. Um, and then once you have the solutions of the subproblems, you're going to somehow co combine them to get the solution of the full problem. And in general, to do that combining, you may have to do some additional computation uh, to sort of like, um, you know, uh, handle some, some, you know, possible solutions that would go beyond just the solutions of the subproblems. And I'll do an example now, which maybe will make this, uh, you know, clear if this is like a little bit too abstract. Probably the like best known uh, algorithm of a, of a uh, you know, best named sort of classical divide and conquer algorithm is this sorting algorithm called merge sort. Um, so, so let's just, um, you know, uh, maybe you know this already, but just to kind of set the stage, let me, um, you know, talk about how the merge sort algorithm works. Okay, so suppose you have some lists that you want to sort. Um, you know, here, here's an example of some list that we might have. We want to put these numbers in increasing order. Um, so here's a strategy for doing that. Um, we can take the list and we can break it in half. So this is the dividing into subproblems. The subproblems in this case are going to be, the, there'll be two of them, the left half of the list and the right half of the list. Um, in all this stuff um, that you know, we're going to talk about, there's going to be some dividing into parts, and we're not going to worry about the fact that when you do this dividing, the parts might not be exactly the same size. You know, in this example, they are. In general, they might not be, and that's not really going to matter so much. So, you know, we divide it into two, let's say, two parts of approximately equal size. You know, in this example, exactly equal size, and then we're going to solve the sub problem recursively, right? So the way we're going to solve the now the problem of sorting the list of length four is to apply exactly the algorithm that we're describing now, you know, until you get down to like a list of length one, and then there's nothing to do to sort it. Okay, so we do this recursively, you know, we go through the whole recursion, if we come back up, then what we'll find is we've sorted the two halves of the list, right? So we have, you know, this, this thing, which is unsorted overall, now it's still not like overall sorted, but the two pieces are individually sorted, right? 
and and um, now what we want to do is we want to somehow produce um, a, a sorted version of the overall list. And the kind of key observation is that you can do that now, you know, faster than if you you didn't have the sorting the um, you know the the halves of the list uh, separately sorted, right? When you have these halves of the list separately sorted, you can very quickly produce a sorted list uh, overall by sort of merging these two sorted lists, just, just going through them, kind of maintaining like a pointer to the place where you're working in each of the two lists, and just always taking the smallest element. So if you do that, then you'll get a sorted version of the overall list. And the amount of time that it takes to do that is just linear in the length of the list, because you just make one pass through each of these, these sublists. Okay, so this is like a very basic algorithm. And um, now, you know, uh, this kind of divide and conquer strategy gives you a recurrence for the cost of doing the sorting, which in, in this context, we're thinking about like maybe the number of compa comparisons between elements you have to make. That's the cost. Um, and the, there's a nice recurrence for the cost, which is the following. So um, we solve these two subproblems of half the size. So two subproblems, each of which now is, is for a list of length n over two. And then we do an additional amount of work, which is linear in the length of the list, right? So this is a recurrence that captures the cost of this algorithm. And you can solve this recurrence by, you know, your favorite favorite method for solving recurrences. And what you find is that the, the total cost is going to be like n log n. And this is like, you know, the optimal complexity that you could hope for in this model for a sorting algorithm. Okay. So, so the nice thing about this is there's like a way of thinking about dividing the problem into subproblems that kind of very straightforwardly gives you a recurrence. And now you can just go through kind of the mechanics of like solving that recurrence to, to figure out what is the complexity of the problem. OK, so what we would like is to be able to do something like this quantum mechanically, but get a quantum speed up. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to kind of kind of find a way of, um, you know, in some in some, uh, you know, under some assumptions, being able to do something like this, where we de derive a recurrence by really just thinking about breaking the problem into pieces in a way that's pretty classical. I and mean, we can basically use our kind of like classical intuition for like what's the way that, would, that it might make sense to, to break up the problem. But somehow we're going we're gonna to get something that's going to be faster in the quantum context that's going to allow us to maybe get a faster algorithm. Not for this problem, but for some problems. OK, so um, to sort of motivate why we might hope for something like that to be the case, let's think about a really simple example, which is like the unstructured search problem the problem of computing the logical or of, of an input string, right? So imagine we have n bits, x1 through xn, and we want to compute the logical or of all of those n bits. We know that that's a problem we can solve in, you know, big O of square root of n quantum queries to the, uh, to the bits, right? That's Grover's algorithm. And we also know that that's optimal. That's the best we can do. Um, but now, can we think about a divide and conquer way to do that, which is maybe going to motivate a sort of framework um, that we could then apply to other problems? Well, there's a natural way to sort of divide up the problem, which is maybe we think about the, the left half of the bits, so like bits 1 through n over 2, and the right half of the bits, so you know the remaining bits. Um, and then obviously, the, the logical or of, of all of the bits is the logical or of the or of the left half of the bits and the or of the right half of the bits. Right? And now, um, you know, classically, um, of course, we could we could try to apply this recurrence. We don't expect to get any kind of like you know particularly fast algorithm for this problem, but it you know things will make sense, right? So the the sort of cost, which now we're thinking about the cost as like the query complexity, so the number of accesses to the bits that we need to make, um, you know that's going to be um, uh, you know twice the cost of evaluating the OR on half as many bits, right? That's exactly what this kind of um, you know way of splitting up the problem uh, gives you. Um, and, you know, obviously the solution of this recurrence is just that the cost is at most n. I mean, the, this is going to correspond to an algorithm that just is going to, you know, um, read all of the bits, but that's something you need to do uh, classically. So that's, that's, um, that's okay. That's kind of the, the best we could, we could hope for. But now what about quantum mechanically? Could we do something quantum mechanically that takes advantage of, you know, the possibility of, of, um, you know, speeding things up, uh, by, by some kind of quantum primitives to do better. So if somehow, um, you know, instead of having a two here, you would have the square root of two. If, if somehow um, you could say that the quantum cost was at most the square root of two times the quantum cost for um, the list of half the size, well, then the solution would be square root of n, right? I mean, this would somehow give you the, the answer that somehow we know is the answer for, um, uh, you know, the kind of the, the cost of evaluating the OR function. <laughs> but this is somehow completely unjustified. 
um, you know, why might you think you could put a square root of two here? Well, you know, in some sense, like, because we know there's a quadratic improvement for computing or, you know, if you can compute this or of two things quadratically faster with a cost only square root of two instead of, instead of two, uh, you know, then you might expect to have some kind of recurrence like this. But, you know, the quantum query complexity of or is only big O of the square root of n. So somehow putting in specifically the number square root of 2 here is not sort of justified by that fact. There's no reason for it to be specifically the square root of 2 on the basis of, like, the, the, the quantum query complexity of computing the or of two things. Um, yeah, and this, you know, the solution of this recurrence giving you square root of n really is sensitive to what specifically that number is. Like, it's not, if you would be off by a constant factor, it could be worse. Like, for example, if the, if the number were just 2, then, you know, you wouldn't get the square root, right? So, um, so that's an issue. I mean, another issue is that Grover's algorithm is not an exact algorithm. It only has bounded error. And, you know, if you're going to do something like this in a recursive way, and there's going to be a possibility for error to come in at every step of the recursion, that's something you have to make sure is under control. You can't just say, well, there's bounded error at every step, so things are okay. If you have a large number of steps, that error is something that could grow. And that's something that you need to make sure is under control. Um, I mean, also, like, I mean, uh, this is very basic, but I mean, like, the interpretation of this two here classically was that we were solving two subproblems. And quantum mechanically, I mean, it doesn't make sense to think, you know, we're, we're solving square root of two subproblems. Like, square root of two is not an integer. It, it just doesn't make sense, right? There's not an interpretation that sort of says, well, you know, quantum mechanically, we only have to solve a smaller number of subproblems. So yeah, this basically like this would be a nice story, but it's completely unjustified, like on the basis of you know what we know about the quantum query complexity of uh, you know the the um, you know computing or. Um, but nevertheless, we're going to somehow see that we can make sense out of this story, and there's like a sense in which we can actually have something like this happen. We can improve these factors to be something smaller in the quant case under appropriate conditions, uh, and that's going to um, actually give us quantum mechanical speedups. Um, and so if you're, you know, if you're familiar with something called the quantum adversary method, which is like a, a tool for understanding quantum query complexity, both kind of, kind of lower and upper bounds, um, then you may have some inkling of why something like this might actually hold. Um, and what we're going to see is that there's like a useful way, a sort of novel way of applying this idea of uh, the quantum adversary method, um, you know, that sort of allows us to instantiate this divide and conquer framework. Okay. So um, what are we going to get from this from this framework? So um, you know, typically in a kind of classical divide and conquer um, algorithm, what we're going to do is we're going to have some instance of size n, and we're going to divide it up into some number of instances, let's say a instances of smaller size. Um, you know, if these would be like non-overlapping instances, then it would be like a instances of size n over a. But in general, they might have some overlap, so it might be you know the sizes of the instances and the and the number of instances might not be exactly commensurate. So we could have, let's say, A instances of size n over B. And then we're going to have a, a recurrence that looks like, well, the classical cost is going to be you know, A times the cost of solving an instance of size n over B, plus some auxiliary cost for like doing some, some work to put things together, like the merge and the merge sort algorithm. And then what we're going to show is that you know, in under appropriate conditions, we can get a kind of corresponding quantum divide and conquer recurrence where we get sort of we have sort of two sources of improvements. One is that um, again, if we have the right conditions, this a can turn. Oops, sorry. This a can turn into a square root of a, and also the sort of auxiliary problem can be solved quantum mechanically. So you can use a quantum algorithm to solve the auxiliary problem. And typically, the way we're going to apply this framework, we're going to care very much about this a turning into a square root of a because that's actually going to affect the kind of the complexity that we get out, like the, you know, the exponent of n that's going to come out and the complexity at the end of the day is going to depend on the fact that this is square root of a as opposed to a, whereas the constant typically will not matter in this term. And so we can sort of like think about, you know, just quantum algorithms for this problem. And we just need to think about the um, kind of asymptotic scaling of the cost for this term. And this is going to be, um, this is going to be sort of crucial, um, you know, to make this like a flexible framework. Um, it's, uh, you know, so, so, and, and I guess a way that this is going to, in some, in some sense, go beyond the kind of the way people have applied the adversary method, you know, um, uh, previously for these problems, um, you know, is that, uh, somehow we will think about like using the adversary, adversary ways of thinking about this term. Um, whereas somehow we can think about quantum algorithms for thinking about this term. And this framework is really going to allow us to kind of go back and forth between the, 
uh, sort of adversary method in the kind of quantum algorithms world as we think about how to develop these algorithms. And that'll maybe make a little bit more sense as we as we look at some examples. Okay, we're going to um, we're going to um, now um, uh, sort of uh, talk about these uh, algorithms all in the context of query complexity. Um, which, which is going to be, you know, the way we're going to quantify the uh, complexity of the of the algorithms. Um, uh, you know, we're going to think about the sort of number of queries that we need to make to the symbols of some character that encodes the input, um, and that's that's going to be really the complexity measure that we're going to focus on for our, um, you know, for sort of all of our analysis. Now, uh, for quantum algorithms in general, um, you know, we we often want to think about um, uh, also the time complexity of algorithms, but that's not something. Um, that we're going to sort of like focus on uh, so much in this talk. I think another interesting question to maybe think about, um, uh, you know, maybe going beyond this work would be to, to uh, you know, consider the, um, you know, to consider the, uh, you know, not just the query complexity, but also the time complexity of algorithms and to think about the sort of um, time complexity bounds that we could get from, uh, you know, from this kind of a framework. But that's something that we're not going to focus on so much, uh, you know, for this talk. OK, so in this setting of query complexity, you know, the input is described by a black box, and we need to make queries to that black box um, to learn anything about the input. And uh, we really just want to minimize the number of accesses um, that we need to make. Um, right? So we want to ask, how many queries do we need to learn some property of the input? And we can think about this in different kinds of uh, settings. So we can talk about the deterministic query complexity, where we have a deterministic classical algorithm, and we want to, um, you know, we want to get the um, the right answer kind of with certainty. We can also think about randomized algorithms where um, we allow our algorithms to make random choices. And now we only demand that the algorithm is correct with success probability, let's say at least two thirds. And you know, we're going to be interested, of course, in the quantum context, where now we have algorithms that can make uh, you know, queries in superposition. And again, these algorithms, generally speaking, will have, you know, uh, we'll, we'll talk about bounded error algorithms where we want the algorithm to be right with, uh, let's say, with probability at least um, two thirds. And we want to compare, you know, typically like the randomized and the quantum query complexity. And we want to understand what kind of speed up we can get. So, you know, a simple example to kind of put this in context is this problem of computing a logical or of an n bit string. Um, and, you know, for this problem, we know. You know, classically, whether we talk about deterministic or randomized algorithms, the query complexity is linear in n, whereas quantum mechanically we can get a square root speed up, and that's really that's really optimal. Okay, and now the sort of like technical tool that we're really going to use to develop this, uh, you know, and sort of like establish this divide and conquer framework is this quantum adversary method. So let me you know briefly introduce that. So um, we're gonna we're gonna be talking, you know, in the setting of of um, quantum query complexity about um, the problem of computing some function f of an input that comes from some set S. S is going to be some uh, you know subset of the set of all you know uh, n character strings over some alphabet sigma. And what we're given access to is you know uh, we're given a black box that gives us the ability to compute um, you know the, the a given character of this input string x that comes from the set S of possible inputs. And our goal is to compute f of x. Right, so f, for example, could be the OR function. You know, and x could be just like a general uh, n-bit, you know, uh, Boolean string. Um, and so the quantum adversary method uh, defines a particular quantity called the adversary quantity of a function f, um, which is related in sort of a, a nice way to its quantum uh, query complexity. So the particular expression that's shown here is like not uh, really important at all for anything that I. Uh, you know, want to want to talk about today. All that really matters is that there's some kind of well-defined um, expression that depends on uh, the function f, and that um, uh, you know that uh, you know will will we'll sort of like um, be related to the quantum query complexity. And in particular, you know what you can show. So this adversary method was originally developed as like a way of proving lower bounds on quantum query complexity. But what you can ultimately show is that actually it's always tight. It provides upper bounds as well on the quantum query complexity. You know, the quantum query complexity really is up to a constant factor. You know, the same thing as the, the this adversary quantity. Um, okay, so that's that's um, this quantity is sort of something that we're going to use to um, you know bound the um, the uh, query complexity of computing some function. And in order to get this uh, these sort of like divide and conquer recurrences, we're going to use a crucial property of the uh, adversary quantity, a sort of like well known um, property. Um, which is that it behaves nicely with respect to composition. 
So we're gonna we're gonna think about some different sort of ways of composing the adversary method. Um, and let me mention two in particular that we're gonna use in in our framework. Before we get to that, Andrew, yes. maybe a quick question, especially since it's from Quantum Leap uh, on YouTube. So mm -hmm. it is 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 black box equal to Oracle? Oh, and there is another question which uh, we also have earlier that I missed, but I think we can get to that one maybe at the end. Yeah. So this is yeah. When I talk about you know um, a black box, this is the, the same thing as an oracle, right? So there's a these are just different words that I guess people use for the same thing. There's an oracle or a black box, a uh, sort of like basically it's a procedure that you can that you can call that will tell you information about the input. Um, and it's uh, yeah, you can imagine it's an oracle that's revealing to you the the characters of the input, or it's a black box that you can make accesses to. And then we just want to quantify things in terms of the number of accesses we have to make to that black box or oracle. Okay, great. Thank you guys for the clarification questions. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So um, so this adversary uh, method has these nice composition properties. One is what I'm going to call or composition. So if you have some function you want to compute, which is the logical or of, um, let's say, two, two functions, you know, f1 and f2, then you can upper bound the adversary quantity of the, the or of those two things in terms of the adversary quantities of the, the individual, uh, you know, uh, sort of sub functions. And the specific, you know, uh, uh, you know, bound that you can give is what's shown here. That the square of the adversary quantity of g, quantity of g, is at most the sum of the squares of the adversary quantities of the constituent functions f1 and f2. Um, and actually, this generalizes, you know, beyond an or of two things to kind of arbitrary and/or formulas in uh, quite a nice way. Uh, and so this is basically the the principle that we're going to use to get the square root of two, uh, you know, in, instead of the two that we would get classically. Um, and there's another kind of composition principle that we can use, which um, uh, I don't know that it was ex that it was sort of like explicitly recognized as as a kind of composition uh, you know principle of the adversary method before this work, but it's it's really quite straightforward. Um, you know, it, it's just the following. So suppose you want to compute some function of the input, and the way that you you determine that function of the input is that first you compute some uh, auxiliary function f of the input to tell which of the functions g sub one through g sub however many functions there are. Uh, of x that you want to compute of the input to produce the actual output. So you first sort of co first compute f. That's like the thing that you're that you're switching on to determine some particular case, uh, and then you compute the function g that that um, you know refers to the particular value f that you um, uh, that you determined in kind of the first part of the computation. And it's uh, you know not hard to show that the adversary um, quantity of such a function you know h is is it at most you know big O of basically the adversary cost of computing the function f plus the largest of the costs of computing any of the functions, you know, g sub s over all the, the possible values s. Um, and so this is really, you know, this is really in some sense not, not quantum mechanical. I mean, it's this is really just, you know, this would also be the case, you know, classically that you could basically get, you know, pay a cost, which is the cost of computing f, plus the cost of, you know, whatever is the function g that you have to compute, which is at most the largest of those costs. So this is not a sort of composition principle that we would expect by itself to give us quantum speed up. But what we see in, in some of our applications is that by combining this with other subroutines that do have quant the possibility of providing quantum speed up, you know, this can this can overall give us some quantum speed up um, that maybe wouldn't be available kind of without um, without applying this principle. Okay, so these are kind of these, these sort of composition principles that we that we can apply, and then sort of you know feeding them into this divide and conquer framework that we're that we're developing, um, we have sort of ways of thinking about. You know, breaking problems into subproblems, and now getting um, you know an improvement to the um, adversary quantity of some function by the way that we think about dividing it up into pieces, and correspondingly, because the adversary quantity of a function really captures the quantum query complexity of that function, uh, we can um, you know we can um, uh, you know get some quantum speed up potentially depending up upon the particular problem that we look at. OK, so if we have some function that's computed by some kind of and or formula of a bunch of um, you know, sub functions f1 through fa, and then we also do some auxiliary computation to get the final result, well, then we can say that the adversary quantity of this function f squared is at most the sum of the squares of the, these individual functions f1 through fa for these a parts of the problem that we solve, you know, plus a contribution that's big O of the quantum query complexity of the auxiliary parts squared. And similarly, if we, you know, can express f by first computing some some auxiliary function to get some value s, and then we compute some function g sub s of the input, uh, you know, to get the the overall value, then there's a there's a similar kind of expression we can give that upper bounds the adversary quantity of the f 
uh, of the of the function f. And um, you know, so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of you know use this in some examples to get quantum speedups for um, you know the query complexity of various particular problems. And you know, the way that this is going to give us a bound on the quantum query complexity is really through this adversary composition. Um, you know, which, by the way, is something that, you know, has been seen before in, in certain kinds of quantum algorithms. Like, for example, you know, the kind of way of understanding um, the kind of quantum query complexity of what are called and or trees, you know, the, the way of sort of understanding that in general, uh, I would say, like, maybe the most straightforward way of understanding that in general goes through this adversary composition idea, but really sort of working entirely in the world of the quantum adversary method. And what's kind of novel about this quantum divide and conquer framework is that it's really going to combine in a in a kind of in an essential way, um, you know, the ad, the use of the adversary quantity for some term where we're really going to care about the constant um, because that constant is really going to determine uh, the sort of rate of growth in the in the solution of some recurrence, um, uh, you know, and for some other term, you know, we can really just think in the kind of with the quantum algorithms world. We can just develop a quantum algorithm where we sort of don't care about the constant. We just want to get the right scaling for that term so that it won't be the dominant contribution to the solution of the recurrence. And then if you would think about the algorithm that would, would result from sort of, you know, un, unraveling this uh, composition, um, really you would have an algorithm that kind of at every um, level of the recurrence is kind of going back and forth between the quantum adversary world and the quantum algorithms world. So that's kind of the, the thing which is um, a bit different about this divide and conquer framework and, and how it sort of, uh, you know, seems like it gives us some, um, you know, novel quantum speedups um, that maybe it wouldn't be obvious how to get, um, or it, yeah, at least it wouldn't be as clear how to see, you know, how to get those quantum algorithms, um, you know, kind of without applying this framework. I should just mention that you can imagine applying other strategies, um, you know, sort of uh, using other ways of composing the quantum adversary method um, you know, th that are known, uh, you know, to potentially get um, different kinds of quantum speedups from a, a similar sort of framework. Um, and that's, I think, a direction for, for future work. But I'm going to focus on, you know, these two particular composition rules in the examples that I'm going to tell you about. Well, maybe the example will answer this question, so I'll let you proceed. But it was going to be about the context in which in which this applies well. But I think the examples will probably answer that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so I guess exactly the the next thing I was going to do was would, was to talk about some applications of this framework and and to show you you know how exactly we can apply this to get some quantum speed ups. So let me tell you about what the applications are, and yeah, hopefully that helps to make some of this you know more concrete. Uh, but yeah, I mean, of course, if there are any questions, please you know let me know at any time. Okay, so we give kind of like sort of four main applications in this paper. Um, two of them are sort of like, um, you know, um, alternative ways of deriving an upper bound on query complexity that was known before, but where our analysis is arguably simpler, you know, once you have this framework established, um, and also where the upper bounds that we get are, are slightly improved, like we have fewer, fewer log factors. So, you know, the, the main emphasis is not on the improvement, um, and maybe more on the kind of conceptual simplicity. So the first of these is a problem having to do with um, recognizing regular languages. Um, and in particular, um, uh, you know, it's the following problem. So we're given some uh, string. Again, the string is provided to us in the form of a black box or oracle. Um, the string is over the alpha and a three symbol alphabet. Let's say the, the symbols are zero, one, and two. And we wanna know, does that string contain a substring that looks like a two followed by some number of zeros followed by a two, right? So this is like a, like a regular expression. And, um, you know, this may seem like a very specific and, and you know, like, uh, I don't know, arbitrary regular language, but, um, the, you know, the sort of cost of recognizing this particular regular language um, was sort of like a key step in this quantum query complexity trichotomy for regular languages, which was, a, you know, a, a paper of uh, Aronson, Greer, and Schaefer from a few years ago. Um, so this was kind of like, uh, you know, having a fast quantum algorithm for recognizing this particular language was like uh, an important subroutine for that. So we're going to show how to kind of um, rederive uh, the kind of square root of n quantum upper bound for um, the cost of recognizing this language, um, and and you know slightly improve the log factors. Um, there also there was a paper a couple of years ago by um, uh, or maybe last year by uh, Akmal and Jin, um, which considered you know quantum algorithms for a bunch of string problems, and there were some kind of string minimality sorts of problems that they considered. The details of these problems are not so. Uh, not so important, but there's cer cer certain kinds of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, looking for sort of a substring, which is minimal in some uh, particular way. And, um, you know, again, for those problems, we're able to give, um, you know, 
uh, simplified analysis with slightly tighter bounds for decision versions of the problem. So, um, you know, the problems that they look at are actually like search problems where they actually want to find this substring. Um, and uh, our framework is somewhat limited in that it's kind of more natural to apply to decision problems. This relates to another open problem that I'll that I'll mention later on. Um, but at least for the decision versions of those problems, we're able to give this kind of simplified uh, and tightened analysis. Okay, so these are like re-derivations of previous results, but we also have a couple of new results which have to do with some subsequence problems. Um, so one of them has to do with like a parameterized version of what's called the longest increasing subsequence problem, which is like a classic, uh, you know, algorithmic problem that's been that's been considered, uh, you know, extensively in the kind of quantum algorithms world. Um, the problem we're going to look at is whether some given string x over some ordered alphabet has an increasing subsequence of length at least some value k. And this k is like a parameter of the problem. So we're not interested in like finding the longest increasing subsequence. We're given some value k, and we want to know, is there a subsequence that's longer than k? And we should think about k as a constant. And so for any constant k, we're, we're going to show that actually we can um, you know, give a quantum upper bound that you know, up to log factors is like the square root of the, the length of the, of the um, you know, given string. And similarly, um, uh, we're going to consider another problem where we're given two strings, x and y, again, you know, by black boxes. And we want to know something about how long of a common subsequence x and y have, right? So they're strings over the same alphabet. They could have substrings that are, you know, the, the same, sorry, subsequences that are, that are the same. And we want to know if it's possible to find co a common subsequence of length, you know, k, again, for some constant value k. Uh, and we show that you can do this in like, you know, n to the um, two-thirds quantum queries. Okay, so let me, um, you know, uh, you know, talk about in, in a little bit more detail about some of these examples. And in the interest of time, I think I'm probably just going to talk about um, uh, this regular language problem and maybe the increasing subsequence problem. And maybe I'll just make some comments about the common subsequence problem, which is the most sort of technically interesting of the results. But there's maybe not time to really get into a lot of technical detail. All right, so let me talk about this regular language problem. So we have this alphabet with three symbols. We want to know, you know, is is the given string in this regular language? In other words, like, does it contain a two followed by some number of zeros followed by a two? Okay, and there's a really natural way of of sort of dividing things up and trying to, um, you know, decide whether, um, uh, you know, it contain whether it contains a, a substring that looks like this um, by looking at this problem on some. Uh, smaller instances, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to divide x into a left half and a right half. And how could it be that the string x contains such a substring? Well, one possibility is that the left half, just on its own, contains that substring, right? Another possibility is that the right half, on its own, contains that substring. But those aren't the only possibilities, right? There could also be a substring like this that goes from the left half to the right half, right? So it could be that the left part of the string ends in a substring that looks like a two followed by some number of zeros. And the right half starts with some number of zeros followed by a two, right? And if that were the case, you could somehow put together the left part and the right part to make a substring that looked like, you know, looked like this. So two followed by some number of zeros followed by a, a two, right? And now, you know, obviously like these parts are really just instances of the same problem on a, you know, uh, a string of half the size. But what about, what about this part? Well, the kind of key observation here is that this part can be searched for using quantum algorithms quickly, right? So you can check whether this is the case just using like three Grover searches, right? What you do is you search for the last two in the left half. I guess it's, it's a little bit more subtle than just totally um, plain vanilla Grover search because you have to look specifically for the last two. But that's something that you can also do in cost like square root of n. And then you look for the first two in the right half of the string. Again, you can do that in costs like square root of n. And then you want to know whether it's all zeros between them. So you can just search for a non-zero in the substring between them. And if you don't find a non-zero, then you know that it's all zeros. Right? So, so this is something that you can do in cost you know, big O of square root of n. You just basically do these three Grover searches. And that gives you a bounded error you know, quantum procedure for um, you know, uh, sort of resolving this you know, third case that's sort of highlighted here in yellow. Right. And uh, so then just using the kind of like adversary, um, you know, kind of composition rules that I told you about before, this now gives you a recurrence for the adversary quantity, um, which says that the square of the adversary quantity for this um, function is at most twice the square of the adversary quantity for an instance of half the size, right? That's the cost of solving these left and right parts. 
you know, plus the cost of, um, you know, this search squared, right? So that's the square root of n squared. Um, and if you solve this recurrence for a of n, the adversary quantity of this problem, what you find is that it is that it's like the square root of n log n, right? So this gives you the kind of square root of n cost up to a, a factor that's the square root of log n, which is, you know, the result of this paper of Aronson, Greer, and Schaefer. Um, you know, the analysis, at least once we've established this, um, you know, kind of quantum uh, divide and conquer framework is really quite straightforward. Like I've really kind of explained all the ideas here on this slide. Um, so it's a pretty simple proof. And actually, you know, I don't think they even explicitly analyzed the log factors, uh, you know, in this paper, but I think we, sh we shave off a square root of log n. So it's like even a little bit lower query complexity that we get, um, you know, uh, using this approach. Okay, so um, is there a question? Um, I have one or two for the end, but maybe I'll let you proceed. Okay, sure. All right, great. So that's um, the kind of the regular language example. And uh, to maybe show um, a slightly more, um, you know, involved example and, and also to, um, uh, you know, show an example of a problem where we, we actually give kind of a novel, um, uh, you know, upper bound, uh, let me talk about the increasing subsequence problem. Okay, so uh, a subsequence of a string as, as um, you know, opposed to a substring, um, uh, subsequence is uh, a string that you get by taking a subset of the characters. You're not allowed to change their order, but um, you are allowed to leave things out, right? So, so you you can you can take uh, characters out selectively as long as you don't reorder them. Um, and now there's a there's this classic problem, as I mentioned before, the longest increasing subsequence problem, um, which asks us, you know, given a string over some alphabet, which you know, to have this notion of increasing, there needs to be a, an order on the elements of this alphabet. So you can imagine that the alphabet is like, uh, you know, the uh, the integers, um, or it could be some you know finite subset of the integers. But anyway, there should be some values where you can talk about, you know, what, some of them being larger than others. Um, so we've got some ordered alphabet, and we want to find um, a longest increasing subsequence of the string, right? So this is like a kind of a, um, you know, a classic sort of like, uh, you know, algorithms uh, exercise to try to find, um, you know, an algorithm that solves this problem as fast as possible, right? So like, for example, um, you know, let's say that our, you know, our string, uh, you know, given to us, you know, in our model by a black box is, you know, 8675309. Well, the longest increasing subsequence of this string is six, seven, nine. In this case, it happens to be unique, I think. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be in general. But in this case, you can find an increasing subsequence of length three. You can't find an increasing subsequence of length four. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, this is, I think, the, the best you can do in this case. OK, so like a natural you know, question to ask is, what can we say about the, the quantum uh, you know, complexity of this problem. But unfortunately, if we just talk about the, the problem of finding the longest increasing subsequence, there's sort of nothing to say. Um, you know, classically, the query complexity is maximal. You just need, you know, a linear number of, of uh, queries. You basically need to read the whole string. Um, but that's also the case quantum mechanically. It's not hard to show that, um, you know, a quantum algorithm um, will really need to make a linear number of queries um, to the characters of this string, um, you know, to find the longest increasing subsequence. So there's sort of like nothing to say about that question. Uh, it's just not a question that has quantum speed up. But to have a kind of interesting question, which is very closely related to this and where maybe we can have some quantum speed up, we can co consider a parameterized version of this problem where we ask for some fixed value k, is there an increasing subsequence of length k? Right, so maybe k is, is five or maybe k is 100 and we want to know sequence that's at least that long. Um, and so for this problem, you know, classically, um, it's it's basically as hard as the problem where you don't have the bound, right? So already, um, if k is two, um, you need to you may need to make um, a linear number of queries to answer this question. I guess if k equals one, the problem is is just like trivial, right? Like every string has an increasing subsequence of length one. You know, any any individual character by itself is an increasing subsequence of length one. But as soon as you talk about an increasing subsequence of length two, um, already you know, uh, classically, the query complexity becomes maximal. And, um, you know, a reason for that, you know, the reason for that is that problem is basically equivalent to unstructured search. And from that observation, you can see that the quantum query complexity, um, if k equals 2, is square root of n, 
right? The, the, the problem where, where k equals two is basically, um, you know, already unstructured search. We know that we have a, um, you know, quantum speed up for, for uh, unstructured search. So we can use basically Grover's algorithm to get a, a square root speed up if we only want to, you know, figure out whether there's an increasing subsequence of length two. Okay, but now what if k is larger than two, right? Um, quantum mechanically, can we still get some speed up? Well, uh, there's there's kind of an easy observation, which is that there's this algorithm of Mbinus, which he originally developed for the uh, this problem called k-distinctness, but it kind of generalizes to any property that only depends on um, you know kind of k of the of the characters of the of the string, only you know that you can sort of recognize by only querying k um, you know pieces of the input. Um, and what this algorithm shows you is that the um, the quantum query complexity of this problem for increasing subsequences of length k. Um, is at most n to the k over k plus one, right? So this, you know, I guess, um, uh, you know, uh, gives us some kind of improvement over the classical query complexity, which is linear for any k. But like if k is 100, you know, it's it's really not a very big speed up, right? It's like, you know, n to the 100 over 101. It's like almost linear if k is really large. Um, and so the question is, can we do better, right? Can we can we do better than this? Is this somehow really the best you can do, or or you know can can you do better, you know even for large values of k? Um, and so what we show is that yes, you can do a lot better. For any constant k, the query complexity is like the square root of n. If you fix if you fix you know a k, even if k is hundred, the query complexity is the square root of n up to log factors. Now, you know, the log factors get worse and worse as k grows, but it's only, you know, a power of log n that's growing with k. You know, this is way better than having the, the query complexity really like become, you know, close to, um, you know, uh, linear in n as k grows. So this is really, really dramatically better than applying that, uh, you know, uh, k distinctness algorithm that I mentioned before. Okay, so how does this work? Let me sort of explain how you can kind of easily see that this is the case, again, using the quantum divide and conquer framework. Okay, so um, again, what we're going to do is we're just going to divide the string into a left half and a right half. And um, uh, how could it be that the string contains an increasing subsequence of length k? Well, one possibility is that the left half by itself contains an increasing subsequence of length k. That's a possibility. Or it could be that the right half by itself contains an increasing subsequence of length k. But then there's also this kind of like bridging possibility where like part of the increasing subsequence is on the left and the remainder is on the right. Right, and there's a bunch of different ways that that could happen. It could be that we have such a thing with i elements on the left and k minus i elements on the right for any value of i from you know one up through um, uh, you know I guess k minus one. Right, so um, we have kind of all those possibilities. Now the sort of last set of possibilities, um, you know, are something that you can sort of like um, uh, understand by you know kind of computing the smallest ending value of an increasing subsequence of length i on the left. And the largest starting value of an increasing subsequence of length k minus i on the right to basically see whether you can sort of stitch those two things together to get something that's overall increasing as you go from the left to the right. That's basically what you have to do um, to, to um, you know, figure out whether you can sort of merge the, these kind of left and right solutions to get a solution overall. And what you can show is that you can um, you can sort of like determine whether this is the case by making sort of like a logarithmic number of um, solving a sort of logarithmic number of instances of this increasing subsequence problem, uh, you know, with parameter j for values of j less than k, and you sort of apply some Grover search. So yeah, the details here you you have to think about sort of like exactly you know what are the cases that you need to cover, but basically um, you, there's some easy kind of like binary search kind of thing you can do, and sort of like you know uh, Grover searching over different different possibilities um, to sort of like cover all of the possible cases for these kind of like bridging strings that go from the left half to the right half. And so um, you know with this observation you get a recurrence for the adversary quantity that says that the square of this adversary quantity is at most you know, twice the adversary quantity for instances of half the size. This is, you know, being sort of added up in, in, in quadrature. So the squares of these things, um, you know, are adding up. Um, so uh, um, so these, this, this work is basically the work that it, that it takes to check the kind of the left and the right pieces. And then there's a bunch of work you have to do to check these kinds of bridging possibilities, but they all involve these, um, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, instances of this increasing subsequence problem for shorter, um, shorter strings. And if you solve this recurrence, you know, basically you can sort of like, uh, you know, show by induction on K um, that, you know, this is what you get for a kind of the solution of this recurrence. 
um, you know, for the quantum query complexity, the quantum query complexity here, um, you know, which is up to a constant factor, the same thing as this adversary quantity. Okay, so this is like a little bit more involved. There's maybe some details that I'm not kind of like fully uh, explaining here, but I guess the the kind of main take home message is that, you know, basically by looking at, um, you know, by sort of like focusing on, um, uh, you know, a kind of classical way of thinking about breaking the problem into pieces and then just understanding like what are the quantum tools that you have for solving those pieces, you can get this recurrence that that now this is just like a mechanical thing. You just apply some theorem about how to solve recurrences that allows you to determine, you know, what is the um, what is the quantum query complexity of this problem. So this really is kind of like the power of this framework that it kind of lets you think about breaking down a problem into pieces in very much the way that you would divide a class, uh, design a classical divide and conquer algorithm and then get, you know, in some cases, uh, quantum mechanical speed up. Thank you, Andrew. That's really nice. Maybe a quick question from yeah. moderated by Shashi Kumar here about the implications and kind of generalizability of this frame of this um, uh, LIS problem to things like optimization or I guess scheduling or routing. Uh, I guess this could be a subroutine in many different uh, things. So. Uh, Maybe that's a general question. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, in general, like thinking about how you could apply this this framework to other kinds of problems is a really nice thing to think about. Um, I'll say a few words in a moment about the this longest common subsequence problem, which is you know one thing we've been able to generalize it to. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of you know problems that um, you know were classically a divide and conquer strategy. Uh, you know, is a natural thing to do, and it would be great to look at more of those kinds of problems and try to see. Uh, you know, where we could maybe get quantum speed ups. Um, you know, one of the, the limitations I think that we have for this method is that it really is naturally suited to these kinds of decision questions of like, you know, kind of does this object exist? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, it, the framework would certainly be more powerful if we could somehow um, uh, kind of really directly approach kind of search problems, you know, with with st this divide and conquer framework. So that's something that, you know, I'll, I'll mention in kind of the, the open questions at the end. But uh, I think for some of the kinds of problems that you that you mentioned, you know, that would be that would be, you know, maybe an obstacle. I mean, or, you know, for some problems, I mean, maybe you can formulate some kind of decision version of the problem that you could naturally approach, you know, using these kinds of techniques. And maybe at the end of the day, you could show that somehow you could use the solution of the decision problem to like, you know, uh, as a kind of like a subroutine to solve the, the search problem. You know, in some kinds of cases, you can do that. Um, but that is that is definitely, uh, you know, I would say a bit of an obstacle to trying to like generalize to to more applications. Um, yeah, maybe that's all I can say at that level of level of generality. Great, thank you, and uh, thank you, Shash, for the question. Good. Uh, I'll let you proceed. Okay, great. So yeah, let me just briefly mention um, the longest common subsequence problem, and maybe in the interest of time, you know, I'm not going to try to do justice to the um, to the algorithm, uh, but just to say that. Um, you know, there's a similar kind of question. So, uh, you know, we can ask about the longest common subsequence of two strings. Um, you know, similarly, um, if we really want to know the longest one, there's not a possibility of a quantum speed up. But if we consider this parameterized version of the question where we ask, you know, is there a common subsequence of length k, then we have a possibility of getting some uh, quantum speed up. Uh, but it's sort of not so obvious how to get a speed up using, you know, kind of known techniques. I mean, the kind of obvious thing to do using this, again, using this k-distinctness algorithm, you know, doesn't give you much better than, than um, you know, an algorithm with linear um, complexity. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think I'm not going to sort of like talk about the um, the details of, of how the algorithm works. But the one thing that I want to emphasize about this um, application, which is... Um, uh, maybe a, a little bit interesting is that um, you know whereas in the examples that I showed you before we broke the input into two parts, um, which is like very commonly the way these divide and conquer algorithms work. You just you divide into two parts. You could think about dividing into three parts, but somehow it wouldn't give you any advantage. So you just you know do the sort of the simplest thing. Um, but actually, for this common subsequence problem, if we want to get the kind of optimal um, uh, query complexity, um, then uh, we we somehow want to divide the problem into seven parts. And if we would divide it into six parts or five parts or two parts, you know, somehow we would get something strictly worse than this. Um, we could divide it into more parts. Like if we would divide it into eight parts, we would again, you know, we would still get, you know, we, we wouldn't do any better than this. Somehow dividing into seven parts is what we need in order to get sort of um, some term 
uh, to sort of like dominate the complexity that really kind of like is the um, you know the what the what the asymptotic complexity should be, um, but uh, but somehow yeah it's like essential in this analysis that we like divide the problem into like a larger number of parts and this is something that you don't see so often in these divide and conquer algorithms so it's something that that happens that's kind of interesting I think in the in the context of this particular uh, you know uh, quantum quantum uh, you know query algorithm for this for this problem using uh, divide and conquer. Okay, so that's, um, that's very good because you actually just answered a question that was in the chat. So thank you. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great, excellent. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know uh, other examples where something like this happens, but it's it's kind of interesting that it happens. I think in this in this particular case. Okay, great. So yeah, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just I'll just try to wrap up because I see we're um, we're we're at the hour. So um, you know what we have done in this work is that we've you know we've introduced this framework for thinking about how to design quantum query algorithms. Um, by dividing into pieces and solving those pieces and then maybe doing some additional uh, combining work. Um, and really, I would say the power of this, um, this method is, you know, through this kind of like, um, uh, you know, uh, this recurrence that like, you know, combines like quantum adversary ideas and quantum algorithms ideas at every step of the recursion, you know, it really kind of allows us to just reason about um, the quantum complexity of these problems um, uh, in a really classical way that somehow we just we just think about sort of like you know what are the quantum tools that we have to speed up certain kinds of subroutines what is a natural way to break up a problem you know that leads us to a recurrence that we can that we can solve just like the way we would solve any recurrence and that gives us a way of understanding the quantum query complexity of a problem or at least finding an upper bound on the quantum query complexity of a problem so i think it's a you know it's a it's a powerful tool to have available because it really allows you to you know um somewhat mechanically approach the, you know, design of quantum algorithms for these, these problems, although you need to have the right kind of, you know, insight into what's a good way to break things up and into, into problems that then you'll be able to, you know, combine the solutions in a, uh, in a fruitful way. Okay. So, um, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. Is there a question? Um, if you are ready for them, yes. I, oh, I just wanted to like end with just a few open problems. So maybe I'll just quickly say say what those are before I, before I'm uh, you know well and truly done. So um, you know I mentioned a couple of times already this uh, this problem of like uh, you know um, sort of handling search problems. I mean the the adversary composition somehow just you know behaves more nicely for for decision problems. And one you know really like specific technical challenge that I think would be a nice thing to try to understand better. Um, is the problem of minimum finding. So you have you have some string and you want to know like what's the smallest character in that string. You know, the alphabet is ordered, so let's say, and you just want to find the, the smallest character. So, you know, that's something you can do with like square root of n queries, like basically just using Grover search. That's something that's, uh, you know, well known, but we don't know how to get that using a kind of a divide and conquer approach where like you, you find the smallest thing on the left, the smallest thing on the right, and then you figure out which of those two things is smaller. Right? That's a very natural divide and conquer thing to try to do. But the way that we know to kind of um, compose, uh, uh, you know, algorithms in this kind of um, uh, way, you know, would not allow us to, to sort of see how to get the quantum speed up uh, from that kind of perspective. So I think if we could do that, it would be, you know, useful for sort of unlocking, uh, you know, a version of this, of this technique that would be useful beyond decision problems. And I think that could be a really, a really useful tool for applying these algorithms more broadly, you know, if it's possible. Um, I mentioned also along the way this idea of using combining functions other than you know and or formulas in this switch case. Um, there are other kinds of functions that are known that have nice um, behavior with respect to adversary composition, and and maybe there's scope there for finding uh, you know new kinds of quantum speedups using a generalization of this framework. Um, and finally, and I guess I alluded to this before um, as well. Um, you know, the speedups that we've we've talked about, the examples that I've shown you are all quadratic or less than quadratic speedups, um, you know, relative to, um, you know, classical query complexity. Um, but there's no particular reason why we couldn't necessarily apply this framework to get, uh, you know, even more than quadratic, maybe even more than polynomial speedup. Um, you know, there are um, some examples that are known of, uh, you know, using kind of regular adversary composition to get super polynomial quantum speedup. And I think it would be, you know, really interesting if we could, you know, see those kind of, you know, new examples of those kinds of speedups using these uh, quantum divide and conquer ideas. Thank you, Andrew, for the really wonderful talk and congratulations on the very nice and interesting results. I think uh, there are there's sort of many questions uh, in we've had and 
once coming in, folks, this is a great time to post more questions in uh, the chat. Great. I'll try to bring up as many as we can up uh, to uh, Andrew here. So for uh, maybe just to start with a simpler question around uh, from Amana from pretty early in the talk, actually, but she was trying to better understand the auxiliary function and what helps think of what sort of quantum counterpart of the merge uh, there would be for that in, in, in the merge sort example. Right. So, well, so in the merge sort example, um, you know, for that problem in particular, you know, there's there's not a quantum speed up, or I would say there's at most a constant factor quantum speed up, uh, you know, for the for the problem of like sorting a list. So that's that's like, uh, uh, you know, now a, a pretty old result that you can get at most a, a constant factor speed up for sorting. So for that problem in particular, I don't think there's a kind of an interesting thing to do, you know, with kind of like uh, quantumly improving the merge. But we saw, you know, an analog of that in uh, some of the examples that we looked at, right? So like, for example, for the... Um, you know, for the regular language problem, this was really just the like the searches that we did to basically see was there a two followed by some number of zeros on the left? And was there some number of zeros followed by a two on the right? And that was kind of like something that we could do, you know, just using Grover search. That was our, our kind of merge or our, our auxiliary computation that we did to kind of um, figure out what the overall solution was on the basis of the solutions of the sub problems, you know, and then and then this additional work. Um, yeah, so that was the the kind of analog of that in in that example, and we saw it, I guess, also in in, in the other examples too. Thank you, Andrew. It seemed like, or it felt like, the Grover algorithm came up in most of these examples as a, as a key block, or maybe even in all of them. Um, you know, is that is that the secret sauce for all of them? Uh, like, are they all somehow derived from that, or is it? Is well, there a sort of more to the story here. <laughs> yeah, there, there is a little bit more to the story. Um, I mean, that was definitely a key step in, you know, the examples that we um, that we went through. I mean, actually, I the one example that I sort of like, uh, you know, didn't didn't uh, um, go through in as, in as much detail at the end, the longest common subsequence problem, the story is a little bit different. So there, the complexity was n to the two thirds up to log factors. And that n to the two thirds really comes from like the, uh, you know, the, the element distinctness algorithm. Uh, so it's like this K distinctness algorithm in the case of looking for looking for two things. Um, so that's kind of like where this end of the two thirds comes from. Um, and and really, so and that was the that was the example where kind of this switch case composition gets used, which I mean we didn't we didn't sort of see it explicitly, but that's what happens. And somehow the switch case is all about kind of like getting out of the way of the end to the two thirds speed up. And if you sort of set things up in the right way, you can sort of have it that that end to the two thirds is really dominant. So. In that algorithm, there's also this other quantum algorithm that's playing a role. Um, uh, so that's, you know, there's some other uh, secret sauce, I guess, in, in that algorithm. But you could, you know, if, if you could find more out more applications of this, this framework, maybe you could use other quantum algorithms in, in other ways to get, you know, potentially bigger speed ups. I mean, I, I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's really actually interesting and nice, nice to hear. Um, this may be a bit of a stretch question, but you, you, um, what about quantum walks? You know, you had you had this no go theorem around the welded tree problem, which is very nice and interesting, and, and I think I understand is you know based on a fundamentally different sort of speed up uh, that has to do that than, than the hidden subgroup problem or the Grover algorithm. Um, right. It doesn't maybe exactly fit into this setting here, but could could this be applied to that kind of question of you know finding the entry and exit vertex in this kind of uh, graph problem yeah it's a good question i don't know i mean i i, I don't know a way of doing it but uh yeah i suppose it's a natural thing to to try to think about um uh yeah i mean um you know the 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 algorithm for element distinctness is a quantum walk algorithm but of a very different kind than the the one for that uh you know um uh kind of uh welded tree problem so um you, maybe it's not so relevant to your question but yeah i mean i think uh uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't thought about that problem specifically. I guess it would be a natural thing to 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 maybe you know think uh, for a bit about whether there's something you can do. Uh, um, I I don't really I don't really know. I mean, I guess um, uh, you know at some level, I mean, the 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 way you're sort of dividing and conquering um, in the applications that I that I showed, there was a very kind of analogous classical thing that you could do, right? I mean, the recurrence does kind of follow some like pretty classical thinking. And there's something where you could you could imagine sort of applying you know uh, classical algorithms to do something that you can you know instead speed up uh, quantum mechanically, but like you know 
it was kind of clear from that analysis that there would be a classical algorithm that would be kind of only polynomially worse. Um, so like the, the solution would have to look pretty different for a problem with exponential speed up. But I mean, I think, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely possible. Um, I don't, mm -hmm. but I, 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 yeah, short answer is I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> good. That's exciting. Maybe that's a great, great thing to, uh, a, a good thing to think about following the seminar for, for not, not for me, but for, for someone. Um, great. No, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Um, so, uh, because we have, um, oh, quick question from Ron. Uh, can the divide and conquer concept take advantage of dynamic quantum functions? And I think by dynamic, you might mean measurement and feed forward. Oh, um, uh, measurement and feed forward. Yeah, I mean, not that I, not that I know. I mean, I think it's important that somehow things are kind of, um, you know, kept coherent in this in this approach. I don't know. I don't know how to take advantage of uh, of some kind of intermediate measurement in this uh, uh, in this kind of setting. But maybe it's a maybe it's an interesting thing to think about. And in the interest of time, maybe last question. This now we're going to zoom out. Um, sure. Because you've thought about so many different kinds of speed ups and algorithms, and, and you really have a great grasp on many of these. Um, where does the power of quantum computing come from? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the, you know, that's the big question, right? I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's definitely something that we can try to understand better through examples and finding particular things that we can speed up quantum mechanically. And that's kind of the approach that I, um, you know, often try to take and that I guess, you know, basically this talk is trying to, to shed light on the question by looking at some particular things that, that you can do. You know, I mean, I guess fundamentally it comes from this, you know, thing that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that somehow you can you can have an algorithm that like, you know, um, uh, sort of operates in superposition, right? Somehow that, uh, you know, explores the computation through a superposition of different computational paths that can somehow, you know, interfere constructively to arrive at the solution, you know, faster. And, uh, you know, but that's like so general that, you know, I mean, the, the big question is like, just how do you arrange, you know, the... Um, quantum amplitudes to do that, right? How do you set things up so that you get this kind of, you know, useful constructive interference? And um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to, um, you know, like answer that in a kind of like a simple kind of structural way that says like, what are the, what are the things that, uh, that lead to that kind of advantage? I, I kind of think you have to, um, you know, uh, explore things in kind of a case by case basis. And maybe in some ways it's, um, you know, uh, it's a more interesting picture if somehow we have to, there, there's not just one way that this can happen. There's lots of different ways that this can happen. And we have to go off and we have to explore what are the, what are the different sort of ways that, uh, you know, quantum interference can be useful. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Would you like to share any uh, final messages or words with us? Um, uh, and maybe one thing that I can just mention in the context of actually a, a sort of a different kind of quantum algorithm, you know, algorithms for simulating um, quantum mechanics um, is, you know, a conference that we're organizing later this summer that, you know, if there are folks, um, you know, here in the talk that are interested in these kinds of questions of, of how to simulate quantum mechanics, you know, uh, you know, might be of interest. So we're organizing a, a conference on quantum simulation as part of this Institute for Robust Quantum Simulation that you mentioned, uh, you know, in the introduction. Um, we're, we're holding this in, in uh, Telluride, Colorado this summer, the week of August the 7th. Uh, and, uh, you know, if anyone is interested in attending that conference, uh, you know, registration is still open and it'd be great to see folks there who, who are interested in quantum simulation kind of, uh, you know, for many different angles. It's a conference for, for theorists, but also for experimentalists, you know, for people who kind of think about quantum simulation in a lot of different ways. And as a completely unbiased, um, uh, person here who is speaking at this conference, everybody should be going to this. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's going to be. I'm really looking forward to it. it I think great. it should be. I think it it's should great. be a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, hope to see hope to see lots of folks there. Excellent. Well, Andrew, I will see you there in person, which will be wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, and congratulations on the great results again. This was very interesting, and we had lots of questions and discussion. We're almost 15 minutes over, folks. Thank you for the lively chat and great discussions and for tuning in with us for 123 episodes and going strong so with that we will see you next week uh friday next friday at noon eastern time unfortunately i'm on a plane but we will have vlad sivak talking about beyond break-even quantum error correction 
and uh, hope to see you very soon on the Kiskit Seminar Series. Thank you, Andrew, and folks, see you next time. Thank you.